Good morning. Welcome to St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Skokie's Sunday morning worship service. Thank you for joining us here again on YouTube. I have just a few brief announcements before we begin our worship service. First, we'd like to wish blessings to all of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. And we thank those in our church family who are frontline workers, as well as those who are teachers. Your determination and endurance are greatly appreciated during these challenging times, and we continue to pray for you. Today is the last day for rummage to be dropped off for the rummage sale. The sale is Friday and Saturday, September 25th and 26th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Shopping is by appointment only in two hour blocks limited to 10 shoppers each. Church members are welcome to shop on their own using the index card system. Please remember to wear a face covering and use hand sanitizer when you're in the building. We are urgently seeking volunteers to work the sale. There is a sign up link in your bulletin or contact Annie Nortz. We also continue to sort and this week we will be sorting Monday through Thursday, all four days, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Again, there are more details about this in your bulletin. Please take a moment to read them over. Sunday school is back in session. Our older kids are doing a Zoom call before church with Karen Christensen, and our youngsters have been sent coloring sheets and a, small, a short video via email. Where there's a will, there's a way. The church council is meeting after Zoom, uh, meeting via Zoom after our worship next Sunday. If you're responsible for a report, please prepare it and submit it to the council drop box for September as soon as you can this week. Please also note that the deadline for announcer articles for October is next Monday the 21st, immediately following the church council. The Undy 500 is back. Delayed, but it is still happening. We are asking for items to be shipped directly to the night ministry. Details are available in your bulletin. There's a lot more information in your bulletin as well, including different ways you can donate, updates on the status of a few of our members and staff, and information about our Village Inn fundraiser for the last couple of weeks. Please take a few moments to read those announcements. And for now, let us continue with our worship. Good morning, everybody. We're going to start with a song. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Let us join together and offer our prayer of invocation and confession. Let us pray. Majestic God, who led our spiritual ancestors with a pillar of cloud that hid them by day and protected them by night, lead us through the threatening times in which we live. Save us from the floods of our own misplaced trust as you saved them from the waters of the sea and the weapons of their pursuers. On this day, grant strength to those who are weak and support for all who are stumbling. Let every tongue praise you as we give account to you of our deeds. We bow before your judgment seat, O God. We have ranked our sisters and brothers by the faulty standards of our society to decide who is worthy of our attention. We have rejected those whom we dislike and have been harsh with those we think do not measure up. We have been quite willing to overlook our own faults as we look down on other people. O oh God, you have shown us a better way. Save us from the pain we inflict and help us to discover the blessing of forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. God forgives us so we really can have eternal comfort and good hope. God does forgive us through Jesus crucified and risen ready to be received by trust and lived out in our own forgiveness of and grace toward others. Have we any reactions to this great good news? So shake us awake, O God, to the realization of our good fortune. To give for the future is one of life's greatest blessings. Awakened, let us give generously. Amen. These are our words about offerings for today. And as Jen and the bulletin remind you, there are a number of ways to do that. But also, we are always grateful for the gifts that do come in, whether by check or electronically. They are needed, they are put to good use, and we thank you for them. Our service continues with our prayer for illumination and the scriptures for this 
Sunday. Our lector is Dan Gunther. Good morning, St. Peter's. Last week, we heard the story of the institution of the Passover before the Hebrews escaped Egypt. Today, we will hear the actual crossing of the Red Sea while the Egyptian chariots pursued. As their faithful obedience, Moses, and God's actions led them to liberty. Let us pray that the words we are about to hear will bring new freedom to us too. May the Spirit move and liberate us from the unworthy understandings of the Scripture, from wandering minds, and to a deeper and more joyful understanding of God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Great God, you parted the waters and the Hebrews passed through. Move in our midst and part our waters too. Waters that discourage us from discipleship, waters of thinking these words have nothing to do with our lives today, waters of doubt. Move and empower us to pass through to the other side that we may refrain our covenant people and grow in our faith and love. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading is Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. After all the plagues and the final conversation between Moses and Pharaoh, in which the Pharaoh told Moses to take the Hebrews and leave Egypt, the people have left and are approaching the Red Sea. Unfortunately, Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army out to retrieve the runaway slaves. Our story picks up here. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This ends the reading from Exodus. Our second reading is this morning. This morning is Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. The Apostle Paul writes about some of the things that those who are on a journey with God should and can do. An overarching theme of this passage is that love respects the scruples of others as long as the bottom line of faith in Christ is preserved. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment 
on servants of another. It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all day to be alike. Let all be faithful, let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do we pass judgment on our brother or sister? Or you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Here ends the reading from Romans 14. Our worship continues with a musical meditation by Ben Westfall, our musical director. Thank you, Ben. This morning, our gospel reading is from Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. This follows a passage in which Jesus instructs the disciples how the church is to work out problems within the community, a model for reconciliation. Next is this. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seized him by the throat and said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and drew him into prison until 
he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here ends the reading from the Gospel and the Scripture for this morning service. May God give us a wise and generous understanding of this, the word of the God of life for the life of the people of God. I shared with you recently the fear I had about being caught as one of the perpetrators of the stolen bell clapper from our seminary dorm. Now, no one ran after me, but I felt like it. I remember in junior high, literally running to my locker after classes and then to my bus so I wouldn't run into Jimmy Piersack, who that week said he would beat me up after school for no reason. Do you remember ever being hunted, chased, or even just feeling like it? Ever get a piece of mail from the Internal Revenue Service? Being pursued can be very intimidating. It's one thing to be in a potentially romantic relationship and play hard to get so the other person has to do some chasing. But when the intent is wicked, it is not fun to be the target. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. Earlier, the chapter tells us Pharaoh pursued the Israelites. The Egyptians pursued them. Can you imagine the ferocity they had, the single-mindedness of their chase to bring the host of Hebrews back into servitude? I imagine horses' noses snorting with the effort, the chariot drivers yelling to urge them on, cracking whips with full throttle acceleration and drive. Have I told you? I've never forgotten when a professor told us the very same Hebrew verb used for pursued when describing Pharaoh's chariots is the same Hebrew verb used in this verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue as the chariots went after the Hebrews to stop their exodus to freedom, just so does God and God's goodness and mercy pursue you and me, the world, really, and the people who would be sitting next to you if you were in the sanctuary in the pews, they were all, if they were all here right now, that love would be pursuing them and is pursuing them also. You are pursued by the love of God. Fervently, passionately, pedal to the metal. Years ago, I remember doing premarital counseling with a couple in which the bride-to-be really made the fiancé, the future fiancé, work at persuading her to marry him. She was not going to be rushed into anything. She believed in her value as a woman and as a future wife. The courtship story amazed me. I probably would have given up if I had been in his place. But she needed to know how serious he was and how serious his love was. He succeeded, and they had been married 25 years. He pursued her hard 
Yet God pursues us even harder. You and I often make God chase us long and strenuously due to our resistance or our ignorance, lack of knowledge, or our fears, pride, etc. We do not even always realize it. Even though I say it and you hear it pretty much every week one way or another, plus elsewhere, God loves you. We can deflect the spectacularly powerful grace of it. There is even a famous old poem about God chasing us and our fevered avoidance. I quoted parts of it in a sermon once. It's called The Hound of Heaven, and it was written by Francis Thompson. God's love pursued you. God's love may still pursue you. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. Like Pharaoh's chariots, with malevolent intent, doggedly dashing after the escaping Hebrews, so does the love of God Almighty pursue us in Jesus Christ. You are worth pursuing to God. Not a lollygagging, distracted jog, uh, nor with a simple sprint that runs out of wind after a while, but like the horses of Egypt, driven not by whips of, or fear of Pharaoh's fury, but by a longing for our salvation and for never-ending community with the one who made us, God loves you that much. Do not presume upon grace, but never forget, nor denigrate out of low self-esteem that you are deeply loved, feverishly pursued, because that's who God is. God knows your name and calls it. Well, how do you and I live with that? With gratitude? Sure, that's a set of sermons right there. In our passages for today, we have some other directions. One fruit of pursuit, to refer to the sermon title, is that we, as, as we have been massively and completely forgiven, so are you and I to forgive others. That's the lesson from the parable Dan read from Matthew 18. I have a friend who is very familiar with the Lord's Prayer, but you will not see him under the roof of a church or a synagogue unless it's for a funeral or a wedding. He brought up the phrase, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and kind of complained about what kind of God we have if God will forgive us our debts only as we forgive others theirs. Like, we have to forgive first, then God will go along with mercy. If he knows Matthew's version of the prayer well enough from the Sermon on the Mount, he might know that this is highlighted, even in what Jesus says right after the prayer. If we do not forgive, then our God will not forgive us. Transactional forgiveness. What happened to grace and God doing this fervent pursuing of us? What about the cross, which precedes all of this? Exactly. Exactly. When the Gospels were written in the mid to late first century A.D., the teaching of Jesus and the preaching of the salvation story had been proclaimed near and far for a little bit. There was still much more time to go and a lot more land to cover. The Gospels are post-resurrection. That means if you're back then reading the Lord's Prayer or hearing somebody read it to you from Matthew and what Jesus says after it in Matthew, and if you're reading this parable of the unforgiving servant in chapter 18, you already know, you already know that your sins or debts or trespasses are forgiven by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. You are not hearing, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or 
If you do not forgive, then neither will your heavenly Father forgive you as transactional, as God's forgiveness only comes when you or I forgive, because we know that God has forgiven us. And they knew way first back on Calvary and at the empty tomb. They come to this with the understanding, the context of the whole gospel story. My friend didn't. He just knew that part. And unfortunately, I have not had a good chance to tell him as he moved to southern Illinois a few years ago. But we hear loud and clear that as sinners forgiven by our loving God, unlike that parable servant, we are in turn to be forgiven, to share the spiritual boon we've received with others, others who, like us, are undeserving. To be able to let go of the grudges and the self-righteous anger that often comes along for the ride, to no longer carry the heavy baggage of resentments and bitterness, that's a gift from God. God gives us this ability to forgive and commands us to develop that gift. It's a fruit of the pursuit. When God catches up to us and we become disciples of the crucified, God calls you and me to realize something. God wants you and me to realize how we have not deserved the grace we have gotten. It's grace. And then says, now you point that grace from me within you toward those who do not deserve grace from you, as you see it. I am not under any illusions about this being easy. I do think that some people are hardwired having more forgiving attitudes. It's somehow easier for some people, but not for very many people. And we do get victimized. People do treat us like a word I'm not going to say from the pulpit. Some of us are so badly hurt by horrible trauma that to talk to him, her, or them, extending forgiveness from the heart, as Jesus put it, that requires the messenger's humility, time, prayer, and respect. It's not about whether someone deserves forgiveness. Clearly the unforgiving servant did not. Although he begged and pleaded for it and referred to his family. He did not. I do not. If we were all okay, Jesus would not have come and died for us on the cross. We forgive those who have offended or, you know, who have trespassed against us as God forgives us. That gift to be able to do that and to go ahead and do it is a fruit, not of human nature, but of God's successful pursuit, transforming us. Jonathan Edwards famously wrote that when he is made aware of the sins or errors of someone else, rather than think he's better than they are, look at, look at them, he uses it, or used it instead as an occasion to reflect on his own falling short of God's desires for him. This is Jonathan Edwards, one of our theological and homiletical giants this side of the Atlantic. I try to take a page, not only remembering Edwards, but from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, and think of myself and that person or group I'm asked to forgive as equally with me beneath the cross of Jesus. There we are equally in need of God. And then there is the old line about resentment. Resenting someone or wishing someone ill unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Unforgiveness, long harbored, can stain our soul. 
So it behooves me to maintain, or excuse me, it behooves me to mention, that Jesus told this parable as a warning to his followers. Do not be like that unforgiving servant who had a bad end. Enjoy the mercy of God. Share the mercy of God to those who have gone against you, who owe you, who gave you reasons for bitterness and resentment. And do not forgive them so you or I can pat ourselves on our spiritual back and feel a little holier than thou. Let us do it because God's love chased us down. And that love has changed us forever. Another fruit of the pursuit of God's love is not totally unrelated, but like forgiveness, also always relevant to the church and the wider community. It's about not being so judgy. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister, Paul asks, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. If you remember the passage, Paul is addressing believers who were judging other believers in the church at Rome on the grounds of what he saw as minor differences of belief, of practice, which hurt nobody. The commentaries suggest that in Rome, there were some Jewish Christians who were so tied, they were brought up to honor the Sabbath, holy days like Yom Kippur, and to keep kosher, while those meant nothing to Gentile converts, so that they found each other inadequate. Why are you fasting today? Oh yeah, why aren't you? Those same Gentile believers, not quite, at least some of them not quite mature in the faith as regarding Christian liberty and the appropriateness of eating meat that might have been part of a sacrifice offered to a false god, so they would avoid meat and they'd be judged by the carnivorous believers who didn't have that hang No one was being hurt. No one was challenging the value or teachings of Jesus. It was peripheral stuff to Paul. So he seems to urge his Roman congregants to be circumspect, to have some humility and respect for others in the community who have some different practices. When Alice Alice Iscariot worshipped here out of the Assyrian Church of the East, or perhaps the Assyrian Orthodox Church, she wore a head covering. No one singled her out for comment. No one called her out or, or pointed at her or questioned it. When we celebrate communion, when we're in person, and we have both wine and grape juice in the tray, we ought not keep tabs on what circle of cups someone takes from nor should anyone take issue with which cup we take. Others may choose not to partake at all on a given communion day, and that is their choice, which neither hurts nor threatens anyone. Are there things we need to open up and talk about, significant things that are to reflect the church as a whole? Then we should engage them, not with judgmentalism, unless someone has been appointed and anointed as a prophet from God. The Old Testament prophets declared the laws of God, interpreted the laws of God, and did pronounce judgment that it was coming unless people and Israel changed back to God's ways. Otherwise, just as the other Sunday, we heard that Paul wrote to the church, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Do not return evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. I think in today's words, Paul would say, chill out. It's all about living in and for God. Paul tries to say that. And stop this putting yourself above someone else in the church who thinks or acts differently than you when it's not a big deal. Who am I or who are you to judge them, he asks. Let the minor stuff go. Instead, focus on this. And with this, I close. We do not live to ourselves. 
and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. This perspective is also a fruit of God's pursuit. And you know, that's good news. Amen. recently lost his daughter, Brittany Stambaugh, to a sudden illness. I do not know details beyond that, he said, although he and his family have lived in the Atlanta area for the past 30 years. Glenn raised his kids to be Cubs fans. And uh, she leaves a husband and two school-aged children behind. Please include the family in our prayers. And so we will. Please join me the spirit of prayer. So
So much is on our mind, dear Lord. But before speaking it, let us remember to whom we pray. The creator of all things. The giver of life. The author of new and eternal life. Further away than the most distant star, yet closer than our very breathing. Hearing all the prayers around the globe in all their languages, yet knowing us and calling us into your flock by name, dear God. In gratitude for your generous gifts of people in our lives, we name Judy Williford. Errol and Dylan with birthdays, and Jackie and Dave marking their anniversary in particular, asking your blessing upon all of them. We give you thanks for all the rummage brought in, for all the sorting and pricing going on, for those spreading the word, and we ask in advance for your favor on the event, helping those who attend, those who donated, and St. Peter's. We lift up those who are ill or anticipating surgery, in pain, or even nearing death. And among these, all we include George and Sue Sparks, friends of Sue Bailey, June Peterson, Sarah and Chris, Hillary and Wes, Eva Viegas, Marty, all with the virus, and others. Hover over all surgeries and medical procedures. Grant endurance, patience, and health to all healthcare workers, especially those most taxed and in the front lines. And of course, we remember those in our own church community. We ask your comfort, O Lord, to be with those who mourn. Specifically, we ask for the family of Henry Carnate, those marking the deaths from September 11th again, Dan's friend Glenn King, and his daughter Brittany's young family, and the family of Skokie Mayor George Van Dusen, whose son recently died. Beyond them, loving God, be with all who grieve everywhere. Those in California and on the West Coast are mourning the loss of property, lives, homes, and forests. May these fires be put out soon, great and holy one. Send out your angels to protect the firefighters and all who are providing service. Our nation and the world faces increasing hunger, Lord Jesus. Show us what you want us to do and how. Point us in the righteous direction to be agents of hope, health, and life. Our nation and the world keeps trying to stop the spread of and find a vaccine for this virus. We ask God's speed to researchers and scientists, wisdom to persons in communities most at risk, and success to distributors of needed supplies. We are a fragmented nation, O oh God. Show us the ways to redemption and healing. Send out prophets to speak truth to us and to those in power that we may again turn to your ways of mercy and love, creativity and selflessness, hope, justice, faith, and honesty. We ask your blessing on this church, our Sunday school, our members, friends, leaders, and staff. Forgive us our mistakes. Use us to serve you and one another and this community. 
provide for our needs, and engage us in prayer as we come to you now in silence, O oh, you who pursue us. All these, O oh God, we offer up in the name of Jesus, who told his disciples that they might pray like this, and using his words, we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.